Kimberly Johnson, so glad to have her here. It's been a number of years uh, and really glad to uh, hear some new work from here, her tonight. She's the author of three collections of poetry, including Leviathan with a Hook, A Metaphorical God, and Uncommon Prayer, and a translation of Virgil's Georgics, uh, A Poem of the Land. Her scholarly monograph exploring the way that Reformation theology provokes poetic movements, uh, developments in the 17th century will be released next year, and maybe later. Uh, not current, but uh, with her husband, Jay Hopler, she has uh, edited an anthology for Yale University Press that surveys the long tradition of devotional poetry, <coughs> also to be published next year, maybe sooner? Is that, is that out? I think it's fall. Fall? Very good. Okay. Um, she's a recipient of grants and awards from the Guggenheim Foundation, the NEA, Utah Arts Council. Uh, and she has recent work in the New Yorker, the Missouri Review, and other great journals. And we love having her here. Kimberly Johnson. for having me and thanks you all for coming and I'm so happy to have this chance to get to know Mike not even not just in person or in the hall but actually through his works that was <coughs> that was really cool it reminded me of a little bit of J.G. Ballard in all the good ways so um a couple minutes ago Joel talked about how he's excited to hear new work which is something he said this morning and I don't want to it, I don't want to, well, I'm a really slow writer, so I don't know how much this is new to you, but it's new enough, um, because it's all from the new book. So, yeah, I don't think I have anything else to say. Mountains for the last frost. Patient in their dark hibernacle wait the twin lobes of the tulip bulb, hanging like a semicolon in the endless sentence of winter. Not yet the green shaft rips the paper tunic in its upward thrust. Not yet knife sits tip through the topsoil, the stalk aspiring up to a swelling of petals, pale bud pursed and then loosened, deepening to red and unsealing itself sash by sash, a leggy dishabille in lipstick. Somewhere on the other side of town, some bells begin to raise their brazen. Everything is about to change. <clears throat> it's called blanks. The sun rolls up like jackpot, the thousand blinding coins of it spilling across my windshield's dust apple. Glory be, my lucky day, flush and prime as a fresh dime, as if the world been spit-shined. The asphalt aheads gleam to a high glare, and I play my pedal past the red line and faster. Must feel what faith feel sorry, must be what faith feels like to drive believing in the persistence of highway lines whose white paints whiten to a wide white field, to glimpse in swift periphery and guess you've passed a rest stop's spare oasis, to catch the flicker of a cactus shadow as a signpost point towards some providential end. If on such a visionary road I should see the world's material scroll back to show whatever lies behind, who would blame me? Who'd blame if I sublimed each raw thing into a revelation? The big rig flipping its rock-chipped stigmata, the naga hide peeling an unction from my thigh, but no. Faith's for the sucker whose luck's run out. Faith is for the fear that sometimes you get cherries and sometimes you pull the handle and it comes up blanks. I don't know what to do. There's just not an, I'm gonna put this right here. That's what I'm gonna do. No, I'm not. I don't know what I'm gonna do with that. I'll just keep fondling it around and fidgeting. <clears throat> this is called Book of Hours. A Pentecost of bloom, all the furred tongues a wag in the iris patch, wind rush through the fire flower. To what wonders they may testify, I don't know. My earthy idiom hears as noise, the hiss of sweet alyssum and the bee's melisma. Shouldn't that be enough? But I fidget around the garden like a wasp for nectar, greedy, antic, spoiling for the ruin of meaning. 
One long morning I looked thus at inkwork on trust vellum, a gospel in cochineal and verdigris, gold leaf haloing the majuscule. The manuscript twined a black briar stem and barb from margin to margin. No untangling that liturgy, no telling the prayers in its glittering pigments. Yet I adored each page and bent to stare so low that my lips touched the seraph of an illuminated tea. I left the archive chrismed with turmeric until in the sudden rain all that I kept of that book washed from me. The spirit's a terse mutter to the flesh's aria, but I'll forget today's ecstasies when the wind dies, forget their honeyed buzz when the bees hive up for evening. Against the stillness of that fast approaching anesthetic dark, I nuzzle the humblest buds to my chin, dust the shyest pistols across my wrist, and when too noiselessly their petals brush my ear, I will declare them from my very lungs, and I will mouth the wind back upon itself, paper white, paper white, incarnadine. Okay, this is called crepuscular. What a drubbing this sundown, its gloom hunting out my sorest remorses to bludgeon me with. That's what the light does in autumn, slanting southward and brownly between the hunched houses of the neighborhood. It falls against the sidewalk like a slab of meat, like a mugging the passers-by pass by. The church bells hang, bang hollow vespers. Is there any sound more forsaken than the rainbird smack across the spent grass? Yes. The ignition jump of a car heading anywhere, taillights red as the rubber stamp on a divorce decree, its diminishing rev a metaphor for the failure of metaphor. The car is a car leaving and then left. So the last time I read this poem in a public space, Jackie Ashro was sitting right there. And she came up after me and she said, People don't know who Chuck Yeager is anymore, you have to tell them. So I will tell you, because Jackie told me to, that Chuck Yeager was a test fighter pilot who in the 1950s in the Bell X-1 broke the sound barrier. So this is called A Nocturnal Upon St. Chuck Yeager's Day. Here comes that sonic boom, thumping at the chest like a kick drum, the first and final beat of a tune called Too Late. Ever too late, the event reveals its narrative to the sense, ever too slow on the uptake. Ever life hurdles, heartbreak to heartbreak, while I rattle around in its mock cone, trying to work out the ever aftermath. To the palm that rests atop the trembling diaphragm, not to calm, but to confirm the body's record, all this shock and roar is a comfort after such rough, rough cleavings, molecule from molecule, the sound shorn back from the air and stacked upon itself, there should be noise. There should be a bomb blast, bell knocking bone jar of noise, a jolt to all wavelengths, a tremor through the pavement, tripping car alarms and dog howls to the proof that something happened. Something happened, something wider than the sky got broken, something faster than a word arrowed into it, and that damned and blessed sonic boom is rolling on past me, drumming up the next dirge by the time I know to mourn whatever it was. There is a series of poems in the book that I have forthcoming that are spoken by um, mostly non-human figures. And there, I, I've had, I, I confess to you, I've had a request from two people who prefer to be anonymous but are reading books by themselves in the back tonight to read two of them. So I'm going to do that right now. Um, one is called Bug Zapper. Oh, the titles tell you who's talking. Bug Zapper. And they're not even listening, are they? Are they? Sorry, we're talking. <clears throat> Come flame moth, 
Come, feathered thornwing, darkling beetle and Asian lady, and come, O oh night wasp. Swift through the soft air fly to where I hang allurement. I am caged moon. I am firefly, firefly phosphorescence, slow gracing to the roof tree. I am anything but this low watt hum, this dim fluorescent sham slung rusting from the great rain gutter, cord rubbed raw to the next rain's sputter short out and dark. When you arc from the ether to my electrical field, I am ethereal, something worth steering for. And if, when you reach me, you should vaporize, well, that's what we celestials do. We firework, we meteor in streaks, lit up like a house afire, like bad wiring on dry rot wood. My brief lovelies, let us spark while we can. I feel a hard rain coming on. <clears throat> and this one's called Wrecking Ball. <clears throat> With what stern determination I love that wall. Its red height so certain I must fling myself at it. An erratic embarrassment of a fling. Chain wobbling through my drunk parabola to kiss the brick. Can I help it that I kiss with all my force? Nuzzled to dust, all my beloveds must wish to have gone unregarded. What do I wish for? The end of love. This one's called metronome, because it's spoken by a metronome. I'm done with this buck and wing, this shuck and jive of marking time for you. A spring sprung, a gear catch at each left hand lurch, and zing, I'm a hitch in my get along. I lopside like a kite ride, struggle upright from the downswing, my hammer hand dragging in the end zone. I am become an undependulum. Isn't this bliss, this shift from old reliable to whiplash skip in a quicker than a tick? Isn't this what I've longed for? No more steady you, steady your tune, bury my backbeat in the background. Let the town talk about my late stroke, scold that I put the sin in syncopate. I'll take my limp any time over your well-tempoed clever in the key of never again. And when I'm left to hap my own hazard, useless in my slap and dash, trash as trash talk, I'll hang my long left and shrug, at least I'm loud. So, Mike and Mindy have relocated from the south recently. There are some, there's this bird that keeps like going extinct and then not being extinct in the south called uh, the ivory-billed woodpecker. Uh, they thought it was extinct in the 1930s, and then some people went out with all sorts of equipment and thought that they got definitive proof that it was not dead, but then they didn't see another one again for like 20 years, and then people were walking along in the swamp, and there it came again. So uh, this bird, because it's big and like intimidatingly uh, colorful with its giant red uh, crown of feathers, and it's also got this like really overwhelming long uh, bill, the ivory bill of the ivory bill woodpecker. Sometimes when people see it swooping toward them in the swamps, they would go like this, oh, Lord God. And so <laughs> one of its nicknames is the Lord Godbird. So this poem is called The Lord Godbird, Campophilus Principalis. Knock, knock on the cracked bark of the sweet gum, and knock, knock in echo through cypresses swamp sunk to their bent knees. The punchline is that there's no punchline, only silence closing like a cloud around the place where from you thought you heard me call. You can you who your heart out. I will hidden hold my operatic plumage, fold wings over my ivory and my wound red crown. I will wind so tight myself in feather and fern that you who've tramped years through this tract with your Kodaks, your boom mic humming dumbly reel to reel, must take heavy up the bureaucratic pen and scratch the fatal asterisk to my name. Then, when you've closed your log book and loaded up your John boat with all those unconsoling tools, 
Then will I swoop the Spanish moss, my white wing tips a flash in the canopy like the world's last morning, and jaw my tin horn squawk from trunk to trunk. It's a trick I picked up from the grubs, pathing the fat phloem far beneath the bark, for whose love my bill evolved its ivory curve, my lash flicking tongue its barb. If I made myself easy to be found, why would you look? <coughs> okay, one more of these. This is called orb weaver, which is a kind of spider. I had to be told that, so I will pass that on to you. We don't have them here. Do we have them here, orb weavers? This is a tropical. I've only seen them in Florida. I think they're. I don't. I think they're tropical. Okay, orb weaver. Fie, I say to the knitting needles, fie on their knotted pearls, on the pliant loops of the crochet hook. Fie on macrame, the embroiderer's gaudy floss, and fie on all those green Minervas, each one shuttling the warp of her tragedy line by line until the last picturesque thread pulls tight. That's the trouble with art, how it aspires to have been made. The throw pillows cross-stitched price above rubies never phrase into subclauses. On the tapestry, the woman forever waits at the seaward window, her lacrimal faith never unraveling to resignation, to rage, to the day she shucks the sackcloth, unpins her hair, and bulldozes the porticos down. My spinnerets are honest. When I drag line my aminos across the loom of sky, the pattern grows more perfect in its unmaking. The web silver frantic entangles, the spokes thrashed to snips. I would scorn a thousand squares of finest linen for one rag with a bulb of blood at its heart. How lifelike the design that starts in assurance and ends with a corpse. How providential. Okay, I'll read just two more. Um, so there was this phenomenon that happened in early 17th century uh, Holland. Uh, it was it was the first um, the first bubble, the first investment speculation bubble, um, and it is about it, it was about tulips. People got sort of crazy about tulips. Uh, there were they realized that if you bred tulips, you could sort of uh, change the way that their patterns, their color patterns and color combinations uh, proliferated. The problem is, uh, and something that they didn't know at the time, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the variations in tulip coloration uh, were caused by a disease um, uh, called the tulip virus. And so the tulip virus would get into, inside the bulbs of the tulip and it would mutate the petals as they came out of the bulb. But because the virus was not propagated with the bulb, uh, you couldn't actually you couldn't actually reliably count on having the same coloration from bulb, bulb to bulb because the virus would change and mutate every time you propagated the bulb. So uh, so that's why tulip uh, colors became even more rare because there'd be like one that was so beautiful and so like great and everybody wanted it and they tried to propagate it and they couldn't because it was just like that one that one off. So. That craziness was called um, tulpenmur, which means tulip mania. So this is called a benediction on the tulpenmur of 17th century Holland. Blessed be the disease, the virus subtle plunging to the heart of every bulb to break as streaks and flames through the conservatory, waxy petals freaked with frantic pinks and periwinkles. Blessed be the rankle that stains its mosaic cell to cell, forcing through each blousy stem-heavy bloom color undreamed by the fayest confectioner until the very air seems motley. Blessed the collectors infected by desire. How they want, how they lick their lips as if they would devour at the bud each sudden new original and its exponential next. How they settle for a name that they can hold between the teeth, biting down against this infinite variety. And blessed, oh blessed, all those names, 
all the neat rows of them in the ledger, a dear anthology of failures. The semper fidelis subsides to the fidelis in a season. The volition evolves into the volatant. Blessed that rage to corner the rarest cultivar, to press tight as in a book each beauty made beautiful by its not enduring. Bookkeeper, I am your daughter, believing that by loving I could hold what I loved, forgetting that I loved because I couldn't. All right, so last one, big finish. Now that the last shaft of sunset has collapsed into that rubble of cloud, let's dust off and see how bright the stars are. The disclosed vault spinning like a disco, disco ball been drilled smack into Polaris. My oracles a bullhorn for the end times, portending wars and rumors of wars in the stars course headlong through the heavens. And even though the astrophysicists, as in chorus to the oracle, declare that all this sparkle, every spectacular atom of it, is a death, the expired light of bodies that have burned themselves down to nothing, yet they are so bright and shimmery, and to shimmy seems their light to me, sequins tilting into a spotlight. Don't they move like jubilation on their wheel? And don't they flash with brash abandon? And if finally they should quit their spheres and fall upon us, their apocalypse will surely seem a shower not of wormwood, but confetti, gleeful streaking down the sackcloth dark to pronounce our doom. A wop bop a loo bop, a wop bam boom. Thanks very much.